So I need to ask you all a question. Um, is it me, or does it seem like customer service is getting much worse in the world? <laughs> and it seems like people are either too lazy or they don't really fully understand what their job is. The other day I asked the bank teller, I said, could you check my balance? And she reached across the counter and pushed me. <laughs> So we will get that later. <laughs> so I, I don't know if people are just maliciously not doing their job, they don't know their job, or they just have this new sense of this culture of complacency or indifference. Um, now I can almost understand if we're talking about low wage, low wage workers or, or uh, uh, people that have other difficulties, but too often we actually find this complacency and inefficiencies in places where we actually need the most responsive help. Several years ago, Becky was uh, trying to get some help for her brother to get um, to be moved into a private home. He's, uh, has to, he's a disabled veteran, um, and she she called the VA and they never answered questions. She called them again and they would never. She asked the supervisors, they would never call back. Well, one. Day she was in the VA hospital with her father, and she overheard a fellow on the phone having a conversation. And he was talking about private home health care. And he says, Oh, yeah, we're waiting in 415, blah, 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 blah. And Becky said, Oh. So when the fellow got off the phone, she got up and followed him. And when you know he walks outside the door and he kind of disappears, and she says, Well, I'm going to go into that building right over there. So she crossed the sidewalk, went to a restricted building. Walked in, walked around, no bats, no nothing, takes the elevator, goes to the fourth floor, finds her in 415, and as she walks in the room, the lady says, can I help you? And she said, yes, I, I need to ask you a question. And then she spotted a picture on her table. She said, are those your grandchildren? And the lady said, well, yes, they are. And Becky said, well, look, these are pictures of my grandchildren. And, and the next thing they know, they, they hit it off. Um, and they had this wonderful conversation. And it turns out Becky found the right office, the right lady. <laughs> knew the right information, and her brother was able to move into a private home. <clears throat> How many of you have ever had to go that extra out of your way to get something done? <clears throat> Almost every head's nodding. <laughs> you know, maybe you had to go to um, multiple doctors because each doctor didn't want to deal with your problem, or maybe they didn't really understand the problem. Um, maybe, maybe you went to multiple doctors because they, they couldn't find anything wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Take some aspirin. Call me in the morning. There are times when we know that there are remedies for certain conditions that we have, but the doctor or the insurance company and sometimes even the legal system keeps us from getting the help that we need, the medicine or the procedures. Unfortunately, too often, we have to pester the people whose job it is to help us to help us. And we can find examples of that in the Bible. There's a really fun story in, in Luke 18 about a, a woman who goes before the judge. She's trying to get um, help for some, some things that are being done wrong to her, but she's a woman. So they're not going to pay attention to her, and she goes back and back and back and back. And finally, in Luke 18, verse 5, he says, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come back and attack me. <laughs> that wasn't Becky's first time at the VA behind the door. <laughs> yeah, Ashville Security at the VA knows her by name, right? <laughs> Persistence pays. This morning, is our last sermon about women who persist, women of courage, women of bravery. And I left this Bible character at the last, at the last of the series because it's a difficult story to hear. In fact, this story is in a book I have called The Hard Sayings of Jesus. And it's a story from Matthew 15, and it's the same story that's in Mark 7. There's two different perspectives on it. We're going to be reading from Matthew 15. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and start finding Matthew verse 21. But I'm also going to be making references to 
what Mark talks about, because you see, Mark is probably the older gospel, and the book of Matthew gives you the, the Jewish context for what's happening in the story. So if you found that spot, in the back, let's go ahead and jump in. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came out, crying out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Now let me pause for a second here. In, in Mark's Gospel, he says, the woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. So the question, where is this Tyre and Sidon? Well, there are two small towns on the coast in what was called the country of Syria, Phoenicia, which is now modern-day Jordan. So Jesus and his disciples, they're going up into another country. What are they doing up there? Why are they so far north of the Sea of Galilee? Why are they in this other country? Well, if you get to, um, in Mark's Gospel, he says that he entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yeah, he could not keep his present secret. So Mark says that Jesus and his disciples go up to this place to find a place to get away. Like the Southwest Airline commercial. You want to get away for a while? <laughs> right? they, 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 went to, they went to Tyre and Syndrome. They went to the area up there. And he's, he's finding a nice house where he can hang out. And, and he doesn't have to deal with the Pharisees. But word gets out that he's there. <clears throat> Even the Greeks of that area had heard about Jesus. And this Greek Syrophoenician woman, she knows that Jesus is said to be a descendant of King David. And that sounds a lot like the prophet. Messiah is supposed to be descended from the line of David. So she's literally more eager ready to recognize Jesus as the Messiah than the Pharisees Jesus has been trying to get away from because they're nagging at him. So he goes to another country and he finds a person more faithful there than he has in his own country. So before I say much more about this, this woman, you have to understand they kind of thought she was crazy. They thought she was crazy because she wasn't obeying the cultural norms of the time. First of all, a woman at that time did not approach a man. And certainly a woman didn't start having a conversation with another man without a male relative present. Those were the rules she was breaking them. So this woman is breaking these cultural norms in her persistence to gain an audience with the person that she had heard about, the Lord, the son of David, the healer. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. Where well, she keeps crying after that. <clears throat> did you get that? The lady's been pleading and pleading and pleading. We don't know if she's been there nagging at these disciples for days or hours. We don't know. We just know that she's been very wet, persistent. Now, would you call it persistent or annoying? <laughs> Persistent or annoying? Are you the talker or the listener? <laughs> well, evidently, the, uh, the disciples thought she was annoying. <clears throat> Send her away. She keeps crying after us. She's pesky. Jesus answered to the woman, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. <clears throat> wow. That sounds incredibly out of character for Jesus, doesn't it? I'm not here for you. I'm only here for the people, the lost sheep of Israel. So this woman, she's pleading, uh, Sir, Lord, my, my daughter, she's demon-possessed. She's suffering. I know you can help her. And he's saying, no, I'm just here to help the lost sheep. The Jewish people who've lost their way. 
Anyone here ever missed a flight? <laughs> Had a flight canceled, right? And so you start lining up at that desk to get rebooked. And there's that one little desk with only one or two people. So you go over there and go, I need to get on another flight. And they go, I'm sorry, we're only for the value level people. <laughs> I was sent only to the lost sheep of this girl, not the economy class. <laughs> Ouch. And the woman came and knelt for him. Lord, help me, she said. You can hear the desperation in her voice. And he says, is it not right, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. She called her he called her a dog. Ouch. That word dog is a derogatory term in ancient Israel. When we read the Old Testament, <laughs> dogs are referred to as those mongrels, those rabbits, bloodthirsty hounds that travel in packs and they devour anything in its path. In Jesus' time, it was known as a derogatory term for Gentiles as dogs because they weren't considered covenantly clean. Even Paul calls a Jewish Christian a dog because he was trying to uh, support the gospel. To call someone a dog was not a nice thing. You see why they call it the hard sayings of Jesus? There's a reason not many pastors preach on this. So how does the woman reply? Does she get insulted? Does she react? Or does she respond? She responds. She says, yes it is, Lord. She said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Now if you read this closely, I think you're going to agree this is a really strange conversation going on. First, aren't we all just a little bit uncomfortable right now? Second, it seems out of character for Jesus not to help someone just because they're not a Jew. I mean, after all, didn't he heal the servant of the Roman centurion? D didn't he go out of his way to be present and witness to the Syria or the Canaan woman, you that woman at the well? Why not the Syro Phoenician woman? What are we missing in this text 2,000 years later that makes us think this is a hard conversation? <clears throat> I want to tell you a funny story. Many, many years ago, a friend of mine, um, he's a, a naval officer, and he was checking in for his new duty in San Diego. And so he was in the hotel restaurant in his full dress white uniform, getting ready to go check in. And if you've ever been to San Diego, almost every hotel restaurant serves Mexican food. And uh, so he's in there, and he's eating breakfast, and they bring him a, um, a plate of, of hot tortillas. And this is a really fancy restaurant, so it's in a little silver plate all covered. And he looks at it, and he thinks, oh, this must be a hot napkin. <laughs> So he takes the tortilla out and he wipes his hands and he puts it back in the bowl and he told, he told me the, the waitress, the girl come right over and she picked up the bowl and she brings it back another plate of hot tortillas and as he's eating he keeps reaching in and grabs another hot tortilla and he wipes off his hands. <laughs> he told me later that during the entire meal they kept, they kept looking to see if he needed more hot towels. <laughs> Afterwards, he suspected they were all in their laughing. He's like, okay, now it's your turn. Take him some tortillas. <laughs> this fellow was from Connecticut. He'd never been anywhere with the Abel Espanol. He had no clue. That wasn't his culture. We're reading this text out of this culture. Right? That's what they did back in the day. They used bread to clean their fingers because they didn't use utensils. And why did they wipe the food off their fingers? What did they do with it? 
They threw it under the table for the dogs. Jesus isn't saying anything that everyone didn't know. And the thing is, she knew what he was talking about. <clears throat> yes, you are the master. Yes, I expect you to be feeding those at your table first. But even those of us that are left behind are fulfilled by the crumbs from your table. That single Phoenician woman, she was declaring Jesus for who he was. She was declaring him as the master, as the Lord, as the son of David, as the healer, as the one that transcends all cultures. Because she understood exactly what he was saying. Yes, but even the crumbs from your table are sufficient to heal me. Then wow. Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. See, Jesus understood what she was, the whole context of the conversation. But Jesus needed to know how far was she willing to go in her faith. Would she even take that slide remark? Or would she get pissy and rough? She had faith. She stayed. She took the elevator to room 415, and she knew that that was the person that was going to help her because she had faith. You have great faith, and your request is granted. I want to ask you all a question. <clears throat> Are you the kind of person that gets annoyed when you're around other people of really, really strong faith? Now, do I like it when the Jehovah Witnesses knock on my door? <laughs> no. Well, I admire the persistence. <coughs> do I want to join that guy pulling across down Highway 105 through Conroe and Montgomery? No. But I sure admire his persistence. You know, it would be easy for me to take both of those groups and just disparage them and mock them because why? They don't fit our culture. Normal people don't do this kind of stuff. If I offered you a thousand dollars, would you pull the cross down the highway? Probably not, because it's not normal. Can any of you ever imagine doing anything that was out of your comfort zone? if it was culturally inappropriate? What are the life of your children dependent on? And the mood in the room shifts. I want to tell you another story about an Army Green Beret, his wife Paige and her daughter Charlotte. So during the time of multiple war deployments, Paige and Matt, the Green Beret, they, they found themselves facing a crisis at home. Their daughter Charlotte was living a bout of relentless epileptic seizures. At just three months old, she had her first seizure, and she was diagnosed with having Dravet syndrome, one of the most severe forms of epilepsy you can have. But Matt and Paige, they were relentless. By the age of five, Charlotte was experiencing up to 300 grand mile seizures a week in Jericho. That's 42 a day and two an hour. Grand mal seizures as a little kid. Matt and Paige, they didn't know what to do. They tried every conventional treatment you can imagine, every doctor, every specialist, and they navigated through a maze of medications. The pharmacy became like their second home. With every new drug, their hope dwindled. Her physical development was stunted, and she couldn't speak or walk.
She's strained just to live. Her entire world was shrinking with every seizure. The turning point came when they stumbled on, stumbled on upon a potential help for her seizures. They heard about CBD oil. For those of you who don't know, CBD is a derivative of the cannabis plant, what we call marijuana. They found out it was being used for other people, like Charlotte. You see, it wasn't a cultural choice, but it was a last grasp of hope for Charlotte. Problem is, they lived in Georgia. So Matt said, I can't be a Green Beret and be around marijuana or I'll be court martialed. Paige, who once voted against medicinal marijuana, says we have to do everything we can. So they picked up, he, re he quit the military, they moved to Colorado where they could find some help with their daughter. They found the seed of the oil, not as a cure, but as a relief. And they said that within instantly their seizures went down to just one or two a day. But that wasn't the easy part. See, the hard part was when they got there, the doctor says, sorry, I can't give seed of the oil for children. There's nothing I can do. So they had to go to another doctor and say, sorry, we can't give CBD oil for children. It's illegal. So they pushed for legislation to change the law so that they could give it to her. And, and you saw the results of what happened when she was put on the CBD oil. So their persistence paid. But that was just a poor little shot of it. What they realized was there was little kids all over the country that were suffering the same problem, and it was illegal to do CBD oil everywhere else in the country except Colorado. So they pushed for legislation to state after state after state to make CBD be legal. They changed the healthcare industry. The story of of Charlotte, or what they now call the Charlotte's Web Oil, is one of persistence by her family. It's a story of a serial Phoenician woman that would do anything to get her daughter healed. Their advocacy saw the, the passage of, of these new laws. And what became just a, a parental concern for their daughter became a powerful new national movement. And as I said, they changed the healthcare system. Doctors now sell CBD and CBD oils in their offices because sometimes it's a better remedy than the prescription medicine they want to give you. They changed the world by being persistent. Did they nag those doctors? Were they annoying when they got there? You have to help them. Or are they persistent? See, I wanted to close a series on that I'm doing on courageous women and brave women in the Bible with the story of the Syrophoenician <coughs> women for one reason. I often tell our leadership team, you have to look outside of the box for how we can do things. Moving outside the box means we have to try different things so that our Cold Spring Methodist Church culture can be a better witness to those in our community that need us. And I know it can be awkward at times. It can be awkward when the choir reads the verses of a hymn. Who does that? We did. It can be Unusual to see coats hanging outside a door when you walk in a, in a room to remind people of the movement. Who does that? 
We did. Who changes and stops passing the offering tray? Your crazy pastor did. <laughs> it doesn't mean that everything you try works, but it means to get out of the box and try. Sometimes church culture needs a little kick in the backside so that we get outside of our cultural norms and we stop saying, well, that's the way we always do it. You don't grow in Christ by being the same people. That Syrophoenician woman, she's a reminder to all of us that it's okay to move outside of cultural norms. Because when we do anything in faith, God's going to come along right beside us. He gives us the strength. God gives the, us the clarity when we need it the most. He's going to push us forward to find that relief that we're looking for. He's going to push us forward to find that healing that we know is there. He's going to push us forward to find those that need us. And what he's saying is that you have to let people have the crumbs off your table so that you can be witnesses to Christ in this community. The disciples learned something very important that day from the woman that pestered them. What did you all learn from that courageous woman today? Let me close with a scripture from Apostle Paul. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that may you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's go. Gracious and loving Father, we are grateful for the stories that we hear, the stories of courage, the stories of bravery, the stories of all those that are marginalized in the Bible and how we can lift them up to model ourselves after them. And Lord, we're just so grateful for this congregation, for this outpouring of love and support in this house for each and every one that comes through the door. Everyone who comes through the doors leaves changed because they're blessed and they're loved and they leave with more faith than they arrived. And Lord, we just ask you to continue to shower that blessing upon us let us continue to serve in your grace and for your glory. In your son's name we pray. Amen.